And that is how you start a church service off. I don't know about you, but I am excited to be in church today. Why don't you look at your neighbor and look at them and say, I'm excited too. If you're online, throw that in the chat. Say, hey, I'm excited to be here today. Come on, look at your second choice and say, you look good too. Don't worry, you look good. I'm trying to help some of the single people out today, guys. <laughs> well, we are so glad that you decided to worship with us today. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Corey, and I'm an associate pastor here on the team. And I just want to take a moment before we go any further in service to encourage you in worship. Because I was reading in the Bible this week out of Lamentations chapter 3. And if you're familiar with the book of Lamentations, you would know that it's just one writer lamenting. Which means if you came in today and you're feeling a little discouraged, it's not a great book to read often. But as I was reading it, I felt like I could relate. And I was like, and I'm not, I was looking at God, I'm like, I'm not in a crazy season of mourning. But I read Leviticus chapter 3 verse 4. And it says, he has made my skin and my flesh grow old. Amen, right there. And has broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. And I just love, not that I'm saying this, but I love the authentic, authenticity of the writer because he essentially says, I'm old, I'm broken, I'm surrounded by people I'm not sure if I even like, I'm bitter and I should be dead. And if we're real with ourselves, we've probably felt one of those emotions before. And maybe you feel that today as you walked into the room. And I wanna encourage you because the writer doesn't stop there because he goes on to Lamentations chapter three, verse 21. And he says, yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Would you say hope? Therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. If you walked in today, let me tell you, God never fails. He is faithful. And if you feel old, broken, discouraged, hurt, holding on to something, now is your time. Worship is your moment to come to God and say, God, I'm gonna trust and declare that your compassion, you are a compassionate God, that your mercies are new every morning, that you don't hold my yesterday over today, God. And so you get to declare that today. And so you're gonna see people lifting their hands, people clapping, people singing loud, people singing who maybe shouldn't be singing, singing very loud. But what they're doing is they're saying, God, I am a broken person and I came into church today and I need an encounter from the one and only God. So we're gonna go back into worship and I wanna encourage you, take a moment in service, look at God and say, God, thank you for your faithfulness. Would y'all pray with me? Father God, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to be in church today, Lord. We thank you that you have chosen us, God. You've selected us, God, that you have given us hope for our future, God. You have plans to prosper us, not to harm us today, Lord. So I thank you for everything that you are doing in our life. And we just turn our hearts to worship today. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Hey, come on, let's worship all across this room. Jesus, 
all, give him a hand. Come on, worship him all across the room. As you may be familiar, today is the start of what we call Prayer Week here at One Hope. And it's one week that we do every year before the school year starts. And we say, God, we're gonna set our hearts and our minds and our life on you. We're gonna reset what everything this summer shook up and we're gonna come back to you and we're gonna take a week and we're gonna seek your face. And so on your seat today, you found one of these cards and it just simply is a prayer week outline and it tells you about our daily focuses each day. And today's focus is our hearts. And so I wanna take a moment to pray and to intercede and ask God to touch our hearts today because Second Chronicles 16, nine says, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God is seeking and God is looking across earth for people whose hearts are fully submitted to him. And so as a church, I want us to take a moment in service before we go any further and let's set our hearts on God. So would y'all pray with me all across this room? Father God, we come to you today in your presence and in your room and we just thank you that you are a loving Father, God, that you have chosen us for such a time as this, God. So thank you for selecting us, God. We thank you for salvation and today, God, we ask for a renewed salvation. Holy Spirit, we invite you into our heart again. God, fill us anew today, God. Fill our hearts today, God. We just set our hearts today and we declare our dependence on you because you are all that we need today, God. God, I thank you for each and every person in this room, Lord. I pray that you will touch them and you'll mend them, Lord. And and as we just set our hearts to you, God, that you'll open their eyes, you'll open their hands, and you'll open their hearts to see that you are moving in their life, God. Right now, we just ask right now that you help us to make worship and prayer the priority of our life. God, because we need you. I can't go to work without you. I can't go to my family without you. God, I can't wake up without you. I need you in my life today. So God, we just worship you in everything that you are. Come on, let's sing this song out. Let's sing Jesus again. Sing that out again. being with you. I just want to take a moment right now, though, before we go any further, and I just want to welcome all those who are here for the first time. One Hope, would you put your hands together for those who are here for the first time? If you're joining us online, we're glad you are here. We hope that you'll come join us in person soon and see the movement, because there's something special about being in a room, worshiping God together with your church family. So we hope you'll join us soon. I also hope that 
you were given a worship guide on your way in. And in that worship guide, it's going to tell you more information about our church, such as our free coffee that's available in the hallway, our children's services that take place just down the hall, and our mother's room for moms and infants who need to avail themselves of that. And so we've got a great day planned for you. Sounded like, uh, what's the pig in <laughs> Looney Tunes? That, 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 that. So we got a great day. <laughs> We've got a great day planned for you. So before we hop into the message, why don't you take about 30 seconds, say hey to your neighbor and find your seat. Hey everyone, my name is Morgan. Whether you're joining us in person or you're joining us online, we know that God has something special planned for you today. On your way in, one of our greeters handed you a worship guide. On the inside cover, you will find more information about the church, such as the free coffee in the hallway, our children's services that take place just down the hall, and the mother's room for moms who need to care for their young children. You will also find what we call a connection card. When you fill it out, the connection card does what it says. It connects you to the church. But don't worry, we give you the hassle-free guarantee. No one is going to call or come to your house. We simply want to send you a letter from our pastor welcoming you to One Hope. You can also fill out the connection card by texting One Hope to 94253. Also, our fall small group semester is just around the corner. If you would like to host a small group this semester, or you would like more information about small groups, simply click the link on our website or join us for small group host training each Sunday in August. If you're new to One Hope or want to learn more about the church, we would love for you to join us today for Next Steps. At Next Steps, you will have an opportunity to become a member of One Hope, take a personality and spiritual gifts assessment, and find out how God uniquely created you to make a difference. Next Steps takes place each Sunday at 1030 a.m. Well, that's all for me. Let's get ready for the message. Welcome to church, everyone. We're so glad that y'all are decided to join us today. If you're joining online, we're glad that you're here with us as well. I do want to address the elephant in the room because I can see your jaws at the floor right now. No, I am not Pastor Josh. Yes, I am better looking, so you are going to have to deal with it. So it's okay. You can pick up your jaws. I understand. I do the same thing. So it's, it's completely understood. I am excited to be able to share with you today. I actually, if you want to know this, I did not think I was preaching today. Uh, We talked about this a while ago, and I did not think I was going to actually preach today because some of you may know this. I have a wife who is 39 weeks pregnant with my first child. So what that means is that the fact that I'm here today is because God ordained it and God planned, and I have a word for you. So I'm excited to share with you. We would appreciate all prayers right now. I'm actually impressed to see her sitting down because I don't see this often as she is walking, squatting, trying to do anything to get the baby out. And so (laughs) if y'all would pray for us. Also, if you see Megan, who's sitting over here on the front row, just tell her how fine she looks. She's looking skinny, thin, looking like a snack. (laughs) Like to call her my sugar mama. (laughs) So <laughs> she's looking good. Um, it, I really do. I love you. Thank you for always being supportive. And I'm excited to go on this journey together because we have no clue what we're doing. We, all we know is that the doctor said it's going to come out eventually and we're going to have a baby and we're going to have to learn how to raise it. But I've heard, I've heard that it's kind of hard to screw up a baby in the very beginning. Is that true? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I'm excited to share with you today. Today, we are actually kicking off a new series that we call Blueprint. And the reason we titled this Blueprint is because we believe that everyone wants to live their best life. Raise your hand right now if you want to live your best life. Okay. Give me a big amen if you want to live your best life. Amen. amen. Y'all are great. I don't know what Pastor Josh says, but yeah, this is a ton of feedback and I love it. I will let you know if you give me feedback, I'm more fun to deal with and you get out of here quicker and you can beat the lunch runs. So why don't you give me just your best feedback, whatever you want to say, just give it to me really quick, loud, like amen, that's good, don't stop, you ready, go. Amen. There we go. Y'all are great church. This is why I love One Hope. <laughs> we believe that everyone wants to live our best life, but we know that living your best life doesn't just happen because the reality is that every one of us, if left to ourselves, will suffer from atrophy. And atrophy, as Webster's Dictionary defines it, is the gradual decline in our effectiveness or vigor due to neglect or indifference. You see, the quantity, quality, and strength of everything deteriorates over time. And maybe you're like me, maybe you're not, I pray you're not, you found this to be true over the last year and a half. You see, when COVID started, they closed down all of the gyms. And I myself have a home gym. It's my favorite thing to do is work out in the home gym. But I just thought it wasn't fair for me to continue to work out with all of the home gyms closed. So I closed mine too. You're welcome. I didn't want to be like our pastor and just come up here looking all buff and fit for you. I closed mine. But a couple months go down the road and I haven't looked in a mirror and I haven't, I haven't hopped on a scale. I probably haven't even showered if I'm being honest because y'all know how the early days of COVID were. You, you avoided showers at all cost. And... I got on the scale and I realized that I had accomplished something. I had officially put on what a lot of people refer to as the COVID-19. If you know what that means, it means you gain 19 pounds during COVID. Well, a couple months later go by and I hopped back on the scale and guys, I did a miracle. I don't know how this happened, but I have officially, just happy to report to you, I've officially gained the COVID-38. Now, what I do know is if I get to the COVID-57, y'all might have to come searching for me because <laughs> I don't know if these legs can take it. And so my goal is to reverse COVID. You know, I'm gonna beat it in Jesus' name today and I'm gonna be back to the COVID zero and looking like Pastor Josh up here on stage, <laughs> looking all good and buff. But what I found is that left to myself, I deteriorate quickly. I deteriorate really quickly. And maybe some of you are like that. Maybe it's not your physical weight, maybe it's not your body, but you find that your strength deteriorates or maybe your mental health deteriorates when left to ourself because when left to ourself, we deteriorate. But I have good news for you. Your strength doesn't have to deteriorate. Hopefully y'all hear that all series. Your strength, your mental health, any area of your life doesn't have to get worse. It can get better. With strategic planning, you can prevent atrophy. In the construction world, they actually call this strategic plan, they call it a very specific thing, and they call it a blueprint. They call it a blueprint. Because everything that has been, been built well has a blueprint. And I like to say it this way, in order to be our best, we have to build the best into our lives. You see, the Bible is the blueprint for our lives. The Bible is our guide. The Bible is our strategic plan to help us prevent atrophy. And so we have a key verse for the series. It's gonna be on screen. If you're watching online or you're here in the room, you can follow along with today's message notes at onehopechurch.com and just click the tab that says today's message notes. You can follow along, find out when I'm gonna be done and, or if I'm gonna take forever here. It's just a pro tip. I don't do this ever. I promise, Pastor Josh, I don't ever look at your notes to know when you're gonna be done. But you can figure that out if you'd like to. But you can also follow along with the message today. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through 5, they're gonna throw it on the screen. It says, as you come to him, Jesus, us, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. You are being built into a spiritual house. The reality is God is building something in us, and it's not something that's going to deteriorate over time, but it's something that has the ability to stand firm forever. And so we are being built into a spiritual house. I want you to know that who you are today does not determine who you are going to be tomorrow. Contrary to what the world believes, with God, who you are today does not determine your future. You are being built into a spiritual house. And I love Jesus. From the very young age, you could see where Jesus was 
very focused on building a spiritual house. In fact, his parents went on vacation with him. It really wasn't a vacation, but for modern day terminology, we're gonna call it vacation. And he went on vacation and then they came back. And about a day and a half later, they realized it's been quiet. There's been no worship music because I'm sure that's what he was doing as a kid. He was just the saint and there's been no complaining, nothing like that. They realized that they left Jesus behind on vacation. And I don't have a kid yet, so I, I don't understand this. But from the outside looking in, I feel like that's pretty hard to do. To find out a day and a half later, like, oh, we don't have our kid. And I'm pretty sure he only had one brother. So it's not like they were missing just like 15 kids. It's not like Danny's family here in church. But <laughs> I love you, Danny. I'm sorry. <laughs> Look, he gave me permission to use that joke after service. Um, <laughs> But it's not like they were just missing. And so they came back and they're frantically, as any parent would, you're you're terrified of where your child is. And they came back and they found Jesus. And probably the last place I would look, they found him in church, in the temple courts. In Luke chapter two, verse 49, Jesus responds to his parents and says, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's, keyword, house? From a very young age, Jesus shows us the principle of the, the importance of building upon a spiritual house. And our house, as we love to say, is we're being built today, not just in a physical house. Buildings are great. We would love, we believe God's gonna open a door for us to have a building and one day we're gonna be able to walk through that door. But for now, we get to operate in our spiritual house because God is building us up. And I love Jesus because he talks about not just your personal life because you yourself are being built up with a spiritual life, but also about the fact that we are a church being built up spiritually. And so today I wanna focus on what we are building as a church. And the first thing, blueprint, part one, is that we are building a house of prayer. If you're taking notes today, that is the title of today's message. It's a house of prayer. A great house and a great plan starts with prayer. Later on in Jesus's life, he's, he's found back at the temple. This time he's a little older and he's got his parents' permission to go back now. And he's there And he kind of comes in a little angry because he walks in and he sees some things happening in the temple courts that he wasn't happy with. He was not excited about it. And as I read this, I want you to read this as he's, he's angry. He's not just like calm Jesus over here talking about how great life is. He's here and he's probably a little angry and he walks in and he says, it is written in Matthew chapter 21, verse 13 says, it is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. And he calls them out because God's house initially is to be built on a house of prayer because prayer is extremely important. And so for the first part of today's message, I wanna share with you why prayer is so important in your life. And so I have four points for you and then I'll have some more and then some more because that's how we go. But the first thing I want you to know is that prayer is the difference between the best I can do and the best God can do. Prayer is the difference between the best I can do and the best that God can do. And from the very beginning, as a church, we have founded ourselves on prayer. It was in a prayer season in January of 2013 that Pastor Josh was praying and God spoke to him that he's gonna move and launch One Hope Church. It was in a prayer season in January 2014 when I was praying, asking where I should go next, and God said, you will move to One Hope Church and move to the city of New Orleans. It was in a prayer season before we ever launched, before we opened the doors of this building, before we had a practice service or turned on a speaker. In August of 2014, we set aside a time, and as a church, we prayed prayed for 21 days of prayer because we knew that prayer opens the door for the best that God can do, not the best that I can do. We also continue to pray daily. We continue to pray weekly. As a team, we get together and we pray weekly for our service. We pray before service each and every Sunday as we walk around this time. If you're here at 815, you'll hear the team. They're playing the worship set and we're not just practicing. Practice is till 8 a.m. We are playing through the set because we are praying and believing that God has a plan for each and every person that walks through the door of this church. And then even right now, behind this curtain, there is a team praying for you because this is a house of prayer. We have built this on prayer because what we know is if we did this on our own power, this would fail. 
Or it just wouldn't be near as successful, near as fun. You wouldn't walk in and see smiles because God is the one who gives us joy and gives us hope in these seasons. And so we know that we had to build this on prayer. In fact, the Bible shares countless examples of why we should pray and how we should pray in our daily life. James chapter 5, verse 13 through 15 says, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And I love this line. If you'll read it aloud with me. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. We say it all the time around here at One Hope. You've probably heard it before. Prayer changes everything. There is healing power in prayer. And when you are sick, you pray. When you're in trouble, you pray. When you're happy, you pray. Because at the foundation of who we are is prayer. Because prayer takes what we thought was our best and gives it to God. And we watch him do the impossible. Psalm 77 verse 14. I love this passage. And some of you might need to put this on a fridge. This is a refrigerator verse. It says, you are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. God is a God who does miracles. And maybe you're like me and you need a miracle today. And, you know, I think we often, we say that miracles are this big thing. Like, oh, we need God to give me a million dollars in my bank account. That would be a miracle. But the reality is a miracle is the fact that you're living and breathing today, that you were able to come to church in this room. That is a miracle. And if you're like me, maybe you need a miracle in your life. Maybe you need a miracle in your family. You need a miracle in your job. Maybe you need a miracle in your relationships or your bodies. Maybe there's a physical ailment that you need God to do it. Maybe, and I think we all need this, we need a miracle in the diseases and sickness that are going around. We need a miracle in our nation because God is the God. I love how Psalm 77 says it. He is the God who performs miracles. And he wants to perform a miracle in your life today. Because when you pray, you're taking the power out of your hands and you're placing it in to the hand of God. The second thing that prayer does is prayer puts my unknown future in the hands of an all-knowing God. Prayer puts my unknown future in the hands of an all-knowing God. You see, oftentimes the problem with the problem isn't the problem. I know, I just bewildered you. I'm going to say it again. The problem with the problem is not the problem. Oftentimes, the problem with the problem is the fear of the problem. It's the fear of the unknown of the future. You see, COVID-19, it's the hot button topic right now. It's, COVID-19 is not the problem. If it was just a disease on its own, we would just be like, okay, it's like a cold, we're going to catch it. The fear of what's going to happen if you catch COVID-19 is the problem. You see, losing your job is not the problem. The fear of what happens when you lose your job and how you're going to provide for your family is the problem. The fear of confronting your coworker with something or confronting a friend is not the problem. The problem is you don't know if they're going to understand that you have a heart for them and that you're trying to lift them up more than you're trying to put them down and that you don't feel better than them. You just want the best for them. You see, oftentimes the problem isn't the problem, but the fear of the unknown is the problem. You see, prayer puts your unknown future in the hands of an all-knowing God. And I have good news for you today. God's not pacing around heaven wondering what's going to happen next. He's just not worried about it. You see, Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 through 34. I love this passage, and I have read it so many times in my life because I can relate to this passage because I tend to do exactly what this passage tells me not to do. It says, so do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. That's essentially all of us. Everyone runs after all of these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. I want to say that line again because I've read this a hundred times and that stuck out to me this week. And that's probably for someone in this room. Your heavenly father knows that you need these things. And he answers that, he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I love this verse because tomorrow has a ton of uncertainty. But if you seek God, the all-knowing Father has your future in your hand. You know, I mentioned earlier that uh, we're 39 weeks pregnant. We could have a baby any moment. But if you go back about 36 weeks ago was the time that we found out we were pregnant. 
And this is something we had been planning for. We were ready. We were like, this is the season. We said we're going to wait three years. We're going to get, have a kid. And it was just we're going right according to plan. And we found out we're pregnant. And I was ecstatic. I mean, if you've found that out before, you understand the emotion. I was so ecstatic because I was going to get to bring a baby. I didn't know at that point what it was going to be into the world. But I went to bed that night and I had this thought. I wonder how much a baby cost. <laughs> uh, some of y'all know. <laughs> And so I started Googling it, and I'm like, ooh, okay, we're going to have to savings plan. We're going to have to get all of this. Uh, let me get this in store. And then I asked my mom, like, how much does it cost? She goes, you'll never have enough. And I'm like, oh, well, that's just great. Thank you for the encouragement, mom. <laughs> and she said, you'll never have enough. So I went to sleep, and we're telling everybody the next day. And they're like, hey, you probably shouldn't tell people. Don't just tell everyone. And so we're getting there. And later that day, Megan gets called in to uh, interview with her work. And they let her know that the company was merging with another company and there was no need for their position. And they, they apologized. They wished they could have had her. But within 24 hours, I went from a high to worry to a lot of worry. If you can feel, I was sitting there and I was like, uh-oh, what am I going to do today? I have no clue. And so I was worried. Well, Ended up being a great time with family because we decided we're not going to worry about this. God's going to take care of it tomorrow. And we get to a season of 21 days of prayer and we're praying through it. And we had set our goals. We knew what we needed to save. We needed, knew what we needed to do to get ahead. And I kid you not, there were days where money was in our mailbox. And I was just amazed at the favor of God. And within 60 days, we hit our savings goal. And within... 90 days, we doubled our savings goal to where we could breathe and feel good because God is faithful. Because when I pray and I seek God, it puts my unknown future in the hands of an all-knowing God. And now I can't sit here and say, oh, I've never worried about it again. I still am like, oh, what am I going to do? But what do I do? I take a moment and I pray and trust God. The third thing I want you to know about prayer is that prayer puts your hopeless situation in the hands of an all-powerful God. Prayer takes your hopeless situation, the area where you see no hope. There's no way out. There's nothing you can do. And it places it in a situation, and it places it in the hands of an all-knowing, an all-powerful God. It's not on screen, but I love this verse. I referenced it earlier in worship. Uh, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 21. It says, yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Say hope with me. Hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. And he ends and he says, great is your faithfulness. Prayer will speak hope into your soul. When you have a word from God, you can withstand a hopeless situation. And that's what the writer of Lamentation said. He said, hey, I have a word from God and I believe that God will do what he says he would do. I love Romans chapter four. It's a story of a guy that we're probably familiar with. If you grew up around church or you're not sure of church, you probably have heard of a guy that we call Father Abraham and many sons. (laughs) There's a little preschool for you. Uh, It's the story of Abraham. And I love this passage because it sums up what he was going with. And so it says in Romans chapter four, verse 18 through 21, it says, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken. Even though, (laughs) I love this, at about 100 years of age, no, I didn't say 70, I didn't say 50, 100 years of age, and I love how the writer puts it, he figured his body was as good as dead. (laughs) And so was his wife. He just kind of threw her in there too. He's like, and so is my wife. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. When you have a word from God, it strengthens your faith. And prayer reminds you of the word from God. And as you continue to pray, you'll watch as your faith gets stronger and stronger. And I believe that's what Abraham did. I bet there wasn't a night where he didn't go to sleep and say, God, you said this. I'm going to hold you to it because I know if I hold to it, if you said it, you will do it. Because great is your faithfulness. I had a mentor in college who used to walk around with a lifesaver in his pocket. And 
If you're familiar, we do this around Easter each year as a church. We'll, we'll hand out lifesavers and allow you, we'll say, hey, I want you to name someone. I want you to pray for this person. And when they come to know Jesus and begin their life-giving relationship with him, I want you to eat your lifesaver as a reminder and as a token of what God has done. And so this guy walks around with a lifesaver in his pocket. And so one day I asked him to tell me the story. And he went on to say that he had a family member who had decided not to follow Jesus. But a long time ago, 25 years ago, he named that lifesaver for them and he holds it each and every day, praying over it. And I wish I could sit here and say that the family member is now serving God, loves God. I can't say that. I don't know the end to the story. Only God knows that. But I do know this. When you hear him talk about it, he believes and he has faith that God will do it because if God said it, he will do it. He believes that Acts 16.31 says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your whole household. He believes that God is going to move and he has been praying daily. Maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you have a family member. Maybe you have student loans. Maybe you have debt or some sort or you have a disease and maybe the doctor said you're gonna have to live with this the rest of your life. You have an area of your life that feels hopeless. I want you to know today that when you take prayer, it'll stir your faith. Just find a word of, from God and he will answer because God's word never proves false. The more you pray and declare the promises of God, the stronger your faith becomes as you place your request in the hands of an all-powerful God. The fourth thing that prayer does is prayer puts my broken life in the hands of an all-forgiving God. See, prayer takes your broken life, the areas of your life that maybe nobody knows about, and it places it in the hands of an all-knowing God, of an all-forgiving God. Prayer takes your past, anything you've done in your past, anything you've done, the places you've been. It takes it and it places it in the hand of God who loves you and has forgiven you. James chapter 5 verse 15 through 16 says, If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And maybe you're sitting here today and you're like, Corey, that sounds great. I mean, I get it. Yeah, the prayers of a righteous person, but I think you forgot about that word righteous because I'm not righteous. Well, I want you to know that Romans chapter 3, 23 says, for all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. None of us are righteous in our own power. But Psalm chapter 100 verse 3 says, God does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. God is not holding your past over yourself. And I love that God has recognized this and he's given us a plan and he has an answer to this problem. And it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, in Christ, God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong so, so we could be put right with God. Whatever you've done in the past, whatever you've held on to, whatever's happened in the past, when you take prayer, it brings, prayer brings forgiveness and puts your problems and your past into the hands of an all forgiving God. And maybe you're here today and that's for you. Maybe you're here and you say, I've got so much going on. And Corey, what you've talked about, it sounds so good. I want you to know that I'm going to give you an opportunity today where you can take your past and all of the things you've done and you can place them into the hands of an all-forgiving God. And you can take a step in your relationship with God. And you can begin anew because the Bible says the old has come and the new, the old is gone and the new has come in your life today. So I want you to know that prayer allows, you, allows God to do his best. It brings confidence to your future, hope to your situations, and forgiveness to your sins. So what do we do? I think that's a big question. Like, okay, I know what prayer is. I know why I should pray, but what do I actually do? And I want to close really quickly uh, with four or three points on how we should pray. Number one, I want you to pray first. I want you to be a people that pray first. I want us as a church to be a pray first church. We like to say that prayer should not be our last resort, but our first response. I love Luke chapter 10, verse five. It says, whenever you enter a house, first say, may God's peace be on this house. Whenever you enter a house, first say, may God's peace be on your house. I'll make that modern for you. Whenever you enter your home, God, have your way in my marriage. Have your way in our family. Whenever you go to work, God, will you just be in work? God, I pray for divine appointments in work today that you will have at a moment with people in work today. God, I pray for the meetings that are coming up today. I pray that your hand of favor will be on them. When you get in the car, God, I pray you protect me as I travel. Let's be a church that prays first because we know that when we pray, God shows up. It's why we do prayer week in August. 
might sound kind of catchy. We start every year with 21 days of prayer in January, and then we start our year by setting our hearts on God. And then in August, summer got a little chaotic, and now the kids are going back to school. Life's coming back. We're going to pray first before we go back to school, and we enter this next season of our life because we are a pray first church. Prayer should always be our first response, not our last resort. Secondly, I want you to pray focused. I want you to pray focused prayers. Develop a list. Ask God to move in your areas and pray specific God-centered prayers. I want to move very quickly through these. I want you to pray for the lost. Let's be a church that prays for the lost, for the salvation of those who don't know Jesus yet. Ask God to open the eyes of their hearts that they may be enlightened to his glorious inheritance, as Ephesians 1 says. Let's be a church that prays for the lost. Let's be a church. I'm just giving you a list of things you can pray for, especially this week and in your life. Let's be a church that prays for leaders. Let's pray for leaders in the church. And I'm not talking about praying for your leaders. I'm praying for God to send new leaders in the church. Let's pray for our, let's pray for leaders in our community. Let's pray for leaders in our family or our government. Let's pray for leaders in our workplace. Let's ask the Lord of the harvest, as Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 says. It says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. Let's ask God for more people to come alongside of us. Let's pray for the lost. Let's pray for leaders. And then let's pray for lasting change. Let's pray for the lasting change, change that will withstand the test of time. You know, there's a very powerful scripture in the Bible and it's a little long, but I wanna show you why we're harping on praying for lasting change. But it's in Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. It says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I'll return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. I want that not to be said about one hope. Let's be people who pray and intercede and we pray for the lost and we pray for the leaders, but we're also praying that it's not just a one moment decision. It's not something that lasts for a week, but we're praying that God, that when you step in, that it will never be unoccupied again and that the spirit of God is gonna move in people's lives. So let's be a church that prays focused prayers, develop a list, develop something where you need God to move. And then finally, I want you to pray fervently. Pray fervently. I like this word because it's not just like, I wanted to say pray passionately, but really fervently is known as people who have a passionate intensity. So I don't want us just to be a passionate church. Yeah, we have passion, but I want us to be a church that fervently prays and seeks God. James 5, 16 says, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Let's be a church that prays with passion. I like to think of it this way. Uh, it's baseball season right now. I kind of go with my favorite sport is whatever season we're in. And it's baseball season right now. And so I think if my coach came up to me and said, Corey, it's the bottom of the ninth. We're down by three. And I need you to go get the team hyped up. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to come in. That's not, this is what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to say, hey guys, let's go out there. Let's go do this. I think we can do it. Maybe. I'm like, okay. Are you ready? Break. Let's go in. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna look and I'm gonna say, hey guys, it's the bottom of the night. This is the moment you've been dreaming of for the rest, for all of your life. You've always dreamed. I know it. You were in your backyard saying it's three, two, bottom of the night, two outs, bases loaded. You're up to the bat. And what happens there? You hit a home run and we win the game. Let's be a church that prays like that. Let's be a church that stirs with passion. Find your place, find your area. Find, maybe it's not, maybe the best time for you to pray isn't while you're sitting at home in your house and everyone's asleep. Maybe the best time for you to pray is when you get in your car and you say, God, I'm gonna go to town right now. I need to pray for my city. I need to pray for my generation. I need to pray for my family. I need to pray for my kids, my future, my job, and just go to town and ask and ask and ask and watch how God shows up in your life because the effective, fervent prayer, a fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And when we pray passionately, you see God move in a powerful way. I love John chapter two, verse 17. This is right after Jesus said, this, is, this place should be called a house of prayer. He sits there and he's like, this is gonna be it. And he's, like I said, he's a little upset. Well, guess what? He says right after the disciples are reminded of this verse and this prophecy, it says, passion for God's house will consume me. 
Jesus was showing us a way to live a passionate life. And I want us to be a church that passionately prays. I want us to be a church that says, hey, I know we got prayer week and we're gonna meet here Monday through Friday at 6 a.m. And I know it's early, but man, it's worth it for my God. It's worth it for my friends. It's worth it for my family. And we're gonna be a people that says, hey, I'm passionate. 6 a.m. for seven days, that's nothing. I got that all day long. We would love to see you here at 6 a.m. praying passionately. We're gonna have the music up loud. You can let it rip. You can pray as loud as you want to. (laughs) Don't do that, actually. Uh, (laughs) But you can let God move in your life. When we pray passionately, I'm asking that we'll be a church that prays first, that we pray with focus, and that we pray fervently. And let's start this week at 6 a.m. to pray with passion. You can do anything for a week, and I believe it. I want to close with this story. Uh, In about 2011, I graduated school, uh, high school, not that old. Uh, And I'm going to claim that until I'm 100. I'm like, uh, 10 years ago when I was in high school, I'm just going to go with it. I graduated high school and I thought I was gonna go to a university in Alabama. I won't say which one because I don't wanna lose half the audience, but you can probably put it together. And I had this plan and told my parents the plan and they looked at me and like, well, actually we had another plan. You got a full ride to a community college in the city. Why don't you spend a year at home? And so I can't really go against that. It's free college. Free college is better than no college. Free college is really better than almost any college. Uh, And So I decided to spend that year. And through that year, I got involved in my youth ministry with my church. And we went to a conference as a team. And while I was sitting at that conference, there's a guy by the name of Mark Batterson who wrote a book called The Circle Maker. And he was sharing about his book. And he got to the end of the message and said, look, if you're here and you don't know what to do with your future, you don't know what to do next. I want you to take this moment and declare and ask God to show up because his whole premise is that bold prayers honor God and bold prayers allow God to move. That when you pray boldly, you see God show up in your life. And so he sat there and he put the scripture up on the screen. It says, do not be a hurry to leave the king's presence. And what he didn't know is during my freshman year of college, I changed my major three, four times. So I went from a communications major, which I thought, oh, I'm just gonna be great. And I realized I don't like English. Then I was, went to an engineering major, mathematics major, and then I wanted to do status t- statistics. And... That was all in one semester. It wasn't like anything actually changed. But I changed my my major because I had no clue what I was gonna do. I wasn't sure what I was created to do. And so I sat there and said, God, I need you to speak. And he had this verse up there, do not be a hurry to leave in the king's presence. And I sat there and asked God, I need an answer because I don't know what to do. The semester's ending and I just need to know what's next. And there are a couple times in my life where I can say, I knew that God showed me a picture and a vision of something. And what he did is in that moment, he showed me a vision of a church. It was a standard church building, nothing fancy. I actually knew what church it was because it was just, that was the only church I knew of like really at that point. And the doors just opened. He said, when the doors open, I want you to walk through. So I thought, okay, cool. I'm called to church. I'm gonna go work at a church. So I go to ministry school and I get to the end of my time and I'm like, well, there's no doors open and I'm now college is ending and I don't know what to do next. And that's when Pastor Josh said, hey, I'm planning a church in New Orleans. Would you pray about joining me? And so I began to pray and it was in a season of prayer similar to this one that I sat down and said, God, I need you to show up because again, I'm at the same place. I don't know what to do. And God said, do you remember that moment two years ago? Do you remember the moment when I showed you what you're gonna do next? Here's your open door. And I believe that this week at prayer is gonna be that moment for you. That this week of prayer, you're gonna have something that you've been asking God for for a long time. And God is going to show up and he's gonna give you an answer and he's gonna give you vision and hope because prayer changes everything. Amen? Amen. Would y'all bow with me all across this room? Maybe you're here today and you're saying, Corey, that sounds good, but I don't have any relationship with God. Maybe you're far for God for whatever reason. Maybe there's fear in the way. I want you to know that you're one prayer away from being closer to him. That you're one prayer away from beginning a relationship with God. And I want you to know God's presence is real. And it starts by admitting that Jesus Christ will be your Lord and Savior. That Jesus died and he rose again for you as the Son of God and the Son of Man. His hope is real. So if that's you and you're here in this room and and you want to begin a relationship with Jesus, would you just speak this prayer after me? Say, today, God, I give you my life. I recognize 
that I can't do this on my own, that I am in need of a savior. I believe that Jesus died and rose again for me. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me for trying to live my own way and give me the power to follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Y'all stay focused on prayer all across this room. Father God, I pray for each and every person who's here today, Lord. God, I pray that there's an area of prayer, Lord, or an area of doubt that they're nervous about right now, God, that your spirit will speak to them, that it'll speak faith, that they'll find a word from you and they can cling to that word today in Jesus' name, God. So I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for the fact that your spirit touches us each and every day. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's put our hands together for all those who made a decision to follow Jesus. We believe that that is the best decision you can ever make with your life. And so if you did make that decision, if you would, just text my decision to 94253. We want to send you some next steps in your relationship with God. Because I don't want this to be a moment where you come back. And as we talked about earlier, where we pray for lasting change. I want this to be a moment of lasting change for you in your life. And so we want to send you a resource, just some next steps to take in your relationship with God. So text that number. You can also find a connection card that you were given on the way in. If you could fill that out as well. I want to draw your attention again to the bottom of that card, that connection card where it says prayer request. We would love for you to jot that down. We'll have people praying each and every day, believing, standing in the gap for you, knowing that God is going to show up and God is going to move in a tremendous way in your area. So take some time to drop that. You can drop that by the door as you go today. Uh, Also, if you came prepared to give today, you can go ahead and get that out as well. As always, the easiest and best way to give is online or via text to give. You can see the number on the screen behind me as it'll tell you more about ways you can give and how you can give. If today's your first time, today's service is our gift to you. Please feel no obligation to give. We hope that you'll join us and come back again. And we hope that you enjoyed today's message. Also, as you're working on that, I have a couple of announcements for you. First off, I want you, if you're interested in joining the team, we'd love for you to join us for Next Steps each Sunday at 1030. Also, our small group semester is just around the corner. It's about two weeks away from launching. And so we'd love for you to take, if you're interested in hosting a small group, you can register your group today at onehopechurch.com slash groups, or you can attend host training each Sunday in August at 9 a.m just down the hall. And then finally, I've mentioned it a lot today. This is prayer week. And so we will meet right here at Langston Hughes Academy from Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. And then we'll close with a finale on Saturday at 6 p.m. If you can't make it, I would encourage you try your best to make it. But if you've got kids, kids in school, and you just can't come, we also have created an online experience for you. So you're not going to miss out, but take some time. Put aside an hour of your day and just say, God, I'm going to intercede. No distractions. I'm going to sit in my car and I'm going to go to town and I'm going to be in a safe place to pray passionately. So love for y'all to join us. Would y'all stand with me? We're going to have prayer available down front if you'd like to avail yourself of that as well. If you feel like you need prayer for any reason, we'd love for you to come down right at the end of service. So would y'all pray with me as we go? Father God, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity to worship today. God, we ask as we give to you today, Lord, that you'll bless it in a tremendous way. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, y'all have a great week and we will see you tomorrow morning.